Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Matthew. Episode 224, recorded for August 16th, 2023. The Cloud Pod adopts the BS license. Or should we do it with bullshit? I could do it with bullshit. We could redo it. We can keep it a BS in the show notes. Don't we get flagged? Uh, I mean, I can mark it explicit. Ah, never mind. Keep going. <laughs> uh, first up is uh, Amazon, uh, AWS, and HashiCorp have announced the service catalog now supports Terraform Cloud. I did apparently miss this last uh, earlier in the year. Apparently, they started supporting Terraform open source in uh, service catalog, which is great because that was just copying GCP, which I appreciate. Uh, but now they also support the managed Terraform Cloud service, uh, which is great, I guess, uh, because apparently if they hadn't done that, HashiCorp would uh, go after them, which we'll talk about in just a second. Well, now that works for for, um, for for billing for like Terraform Cloud exactly. You you pay for one user if if you got a service catalog calling it, or do you have to pay for multiple? Isn't it uh, in Terraform Cloud? Is it, it's not priced by user, is it? Completely. I mean, it has part of it. Mm-mm. It's been changed, right? So yeah, now it's, it's resource it's based. A few times. It's resource based pricing. That's right. Yeah, I remember griping about that. Yeah. So up to five hundred resources is free. And mm-hmm. then for every uh, hour per resource after that, it's uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 4, uh which I guess is one one thousand ten thousandths of a penny uh, per hour. So it can add up quickly, I guess. And then there's a plus in an enterprise version, which I'm sure costs way more than that because they say, call us, which is always a red flag. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <so>. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cheap. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, having paid for Terraform Enterprise in a past life, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's definitely not cheap. Yeah. Well, let's talk about talking about paying for uh, Terraform Enterprise for all of our friends out there who use things like Env Zero and uh, Scale Set and some of the other Terraform things. You might be a little bit in trouble. Uh, apparently, Azure Corp is okay with Amazon and GCP just riding roughshod all over their open source code, but they're not happy with anybody else doing it, and so they're adopting their the uh, business source license model. Uh, to help address uh, what they consider to be people ripping off their code and competing directly with them. This will cover all HashiCorp products, not just Terraform. Uh, Hashi points out that their approach has enabled them to partner closely with cloud providers to enable tight integrations for their joint users and customers, as well as hundreds of other technology partners. However, there are vendors who take advantage of pure open source models and the community work open source provides for their own commercial goals without providing material contributions back. Hey, I remember Amazon was in this spot one time. (laughs) Hashi doesn't think this is the spirit of open source. So as a result, they believe commercial open source models need to change, and as open source has reduced the barrier to copying innovation and selling it through existing distribution channels, they point out in their good company, uh, in their uh, sorry company pointing to their OSS projects that have closed source or adopted simpler BSL models. They're officially moving from Mozilla Public License v2 to BSL v11 on all future releases. The APIs, SDKs, and almost all other libraries will remain MPL 2.0. Uh, BSL is, of course, a source available license that allows copying, modification, or distribution, non commercial use, and commercial use under specific conditions. Uh, and they point to Couchbase, Cockroach, Sentry, and MariaDB uh, as the developers of the license in 2013. Hashi points out that they are including additional grants that allow for broadly permissive use of their source code, and end users can continue to copy, modify, and redistribute the, cloud, the code for all non commercial and commercial use, except when providing a competitive offering to HashiCorp. Now, here's where I get confused. <laughs> so, <laughs> If I make a product internally that uses HashiCorp for my own needs, uh, and that prevents me from buying Terraform Enterprise because I copied all the functionality for my own personal gain in my company, I'm not selling it, not getting any money out of it, does that count as competing with HashiCorp, or is that okay? It's very vague, isn't it? It really it is. It is very vague. <laughs> very vague. Well, and they, they throw in the hosting language, which makes me, you know, like, my interpretation is, you know, is as long as I'm not hosting a competitive competitive product and and publicly then no but yeah it can be interpreted both ways it's also i also have questions about like is it just the source that, that they care about in that in that sense because everything everything about it is the the the, the source license can i still integrate uh the next version of terraform binary if i download it and use it without modification in my own product and and compete with terraform or with, with the HashiCorp? i'm unclear on that well, see, and, it, and it gets even more unclear when you read the fact. And the fact is, I appreciate that there is one here. Uh, but, you know, so number 24 was, can I host the HashiCorp products as a service internal to my organization? Yes, the terms of the BSL allow for non-production and production usage, except for providing competitive offerings to third parties that embed or host our software. 
Hosting the products for your internal use of your organization is permitted. Okay, but that still doesn't answer my question. And then it says, if I want to build a product that is competitive with HashiCorp, does that mean I'm now prevented from using any HashiCorp tools under the BSL license? And they say, no, the BSL license does not prevent developers from using our tools to build competing products, which is not really how they even the question's answered <laughs> or asked. <laughs> so it's sort of weird. And their example they give is basically, if you built a competitive product to Vault, you can still use Terraform to deploy Vault, that competitive product to Vault, which is just such a weird thing. Um, so yeah, this is super vague, super... You know, I know that open source is dying. I just saw uh, Seuss, I think, is, you know, going back to private equity and, you know, open uh, Red Hat got bought by IBM. I mean, like things are not great in the open source community, you know, from commercial business model side of it. But, you know, this is a really big impact, I think, to a lot of companies who use a lot of the various Terraform products. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a big unknown impact, right? It's potential impact. And that's the worst part about this is because it's not clear and straightforward. You know, like if you're, you know, trying to use something, you you don't know, and it's it's hard enough to to navigate through all the different various licenses and stuff. And when you're trying to pick and choose technology to use, much less if something you're already using changes, is makes it really difficult. I think they kind of force people to build these competing products, though, because their their enterprise product has been fairly crappy for a long time, and then fairly expensive. So it's they kind of bought it on themselves in a way. It's mm-hmm. very true. I do think um, their competitive differentiation between what you could do yourself versus what they were providing in Terraform Enterprise has not been very strong. And then the fact that their innovation in that market has been very minimal, other than developing their own cloud platform, they want to charge you for even more money. Um, you know, they sort of, they sort of just seem like they're trying to grab as much money as possible because they're not a publicly traded company versus doing the right things for the community as a whole. Well, uh, for those people who were seriously impacted, particularly Spacelift, Env0, Scalar, and Gruntwork, uh, they have now created the OpenTF.org manifesto, uh, which is basically their uh, plea to keep Terraform open source forever. Uh, BSL licensing, they say, is a poison pill for Terraform with unknown legal risk and future legal risk, which we just talked about. The use grants are vague, and you now have to ask if, if you are in violation for any project you're doing. Uh, the request, request from the manifesto is that Terraform switch back to an open source license. However, if they do not, they will fork Terraform into foundations such as the Linux Foundation or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which, you know, when I think about what's happened to Docker, uh, that's a really bad thing when that happens mm-hmm. because the community moves on from you uh, and you get kind of left behind uh, and then you get bought by some company we never heard of, divested a bunch of things, and now you have to pay for licensing for Docker for zero reason. Uh, so if I had to pay for Terraform client natively from Terraform someday because some PE company bought them, I'm going to be super mad. But uh, I'll just move to OpenTF hopefully by then. <laughs> yeah, I think the the, the um, them claiming that it wasn't in the spirit of open source is uh, is completely false. I, I mean, for me, I think the spirit of open source is that you can use it for you know anyone can use it for any purpose. That that was the that was the point. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I don't yeah, there there are references to the not in the spirit whereas, you know, the lack of contributions back to the the main code base, which is, you know, like fascinating because it's sort of our gripe is that the enterprise offering isn't just, you know, providing its own value enough. But they're they're complaining that you know, they're not seeing the value of, of improvements being checked back in. So it's it's sort of like it all just falls flat, all the arguments to me. Like, I don't get it. This doesn't make sense. It does. I suppose I mean, maybe people aren't contributing an awful lot to, to Terraform, um, the, you know, the source of Terraform, but they are they are very strict about the pull requests that they'll merge in and things that they won't merge in. There's threads of conversations about features that people ask for, and it's always, no, 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 no. We're not going to do it like that. We've got a plan. And so it's it's very frustrating as a contributor to to to, to have a fix for a defect or a or a limitation which would help the whole community and then have HashiCorp say, no, we're not going to do like that. So, I mean, they're still in charge even though it's open source. But the, the other thing is, it, a Terraform wouldn't be anything without providers. And Google write their provider, Amazon write their provider, or, you know, it's just hundreds of people who are involved in writing these open source providers, mm-hmm. without which Terraform itself would be absolutely useless. 
So well, and, and a lot of those providers they've now kind of pushed to the vendors who need the provider, right? So GCP manages their own provider. Yeah, I think Amazon's managing their own provider now. Um, you know, I was just looking here at their GitHub repo. Uh, they've had seventeen hundred and fifty-two contributors uh, to their open source project. But if you look at the actual graph of contributions, you can see that. Basically, in 2017, about midway through, you know, their contribution was was going pretty heavily. You know, from a lot of contributions, kind of died down, and it's been sort of more of a, a low burn now. So, uh, I mean, again, their peak was 200 <laughs> contributors in a single month. It looks like or a single data point in this chart, which I don't know what the data point is, but uh, you know, it definitely seems like they're not getting a lot of upstream value from the open source community. So maybe that is a valid piece. But if you look at the Terraform AWS provider. I believe it's a significantly different story uh, altogether. Yeah, in a way, ter- the Terraform piece itself is, is probably the easiest piece to replace because all it is is a, an orchestrator. Yeah, so just to give you a comparison, uh, the there's 2,800 contributors to the AWS Terraform provider. <laughs> so, you know, that's a pretty, uh, pretty. it's over 1,000 more. Uh, and, you know, they look like they have over 1,000, you know, they one month they had over 2,000 pull requests or contributions uh, to main. And then they have, you know, they're looking at like they're averaging about 500. So they're doing way more <laughs> commits and uh, merge requests from contributors than Terraform itself is doing. So it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I got a question for you then. If, if Terraform had never been open source, do you think it would have ga- gained the same success as it has? Nope. Nope. I don't think so. And not at all. It's, it does seem to be sort of the trend, which is like once you get to a certain level of establishment and success, then it's like, oh, well, now now we would like to monetize. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, there, there's, uh, you know, so it just you can actually contribute to the Open Terraform Manifesto if you're interested in it uh, by giving them a pull request and you can join as an individual who's willing to provide open source community efforts. Uh, you can be a company if you're, or a foundation even who wants to join in and, and provide support. Uh, you know, so right now there's 87 companies eight projects that have committed to it and 287 individuals now who have all co-signed the manifesto. So not a lot to, uh, I think, make Terraform <laughs> change their minds. I'm pretty sure they have more than 87 customers. Uh, but, uh, you know, I appreciate that at least like, there's interest in potentially forking. And, uh, you know, I think I don't really know a lot about how OpenSearch is doing compared to Elasticsearch because I swore off OpenSearch and Elasticsearch. Not because of OpenSearch, but because of Elastic. <laughs> uh, so I don't really do a lot with it if I don't have to. And I just use managed service if I need to Terraform, or sorry, OpenSearch uh, from AWS. But you know, I pivoted from uh, an Elastic cluster, cluster to an OpenSearch cluster. It was seamless migration, have had no issues, no complaints. Again, the use case that I'm supporting in this case is a very simple full text search use case. So it's not complicated. But you know, I've seen some of the release notes on OpenSearch. It looks like they're doing some cool things. I don't know if it's divested or completely forked away from what Elastic was doing, but um, it definitely seems to have momentum still. It's definitely viable. I mean, it's, at least if you're an Amazon customer, just because of its integration there. And, you know, it is something you can deploy on your own. So why not? It does seem that Terraform's likely to go that same direction, even though they're trying to soften it by their with their enforcement. But it's still just a huge risk. To, to anyone who wants to use it directly in their in a pro- product. Well, I mean, I know that if they if they actually fork uh, a community build, like we'll have that conversation about our internal tool that we built around Terraform and say, mm-hmm. you know, does this make sense for us to follow that path just to de-risk what we're doing because we don't want to get into a situation where that could be a risk. So. Right. All right. Well, let's move away from HashiCorp and their fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, AWS had Storage Day 2023. This is the day where they brag about all their amazing storage products and announce new ones to make it even more confusing to figure out which storage item you may want to use. This is the... Uh, uh, it takes place on the 9th, uh, and there is a replay available to you if you want to watch the video, but I'll we'll summarize it for you here so you don't have to do that. Uh, if you might guess what the theme of the day was, uh, do either of you have a guess what it might have been? Hmm. What has everyone been talking about lately? Give me well, an it's eye. not an election year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe AI. Yep. Yep. Generative AI and ML. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was a big theme. And so every story had a bend of like, hey, here's how you can use it in your ML workloads and your AI workloads. So shocking. 
Uh, but a little bit of numbers here. Uh, they wanted to point out that EBS has just turned 15 years old, which is impossible because I've been only using AWS for at least a couple of years. At least that's what it feels like. Uh, <laughs> and I remember when EBS launched. Uh, it handles more than 100 trillion IO operations a day, and over 390 million EBS volumes are created every day. That is a crazy statistic. <laughs> Really like is. I don't even know how that's possible. Like, I, like <laughs> 390 million volumes are created. At, like, wow. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, I guess that's broken down into like p- permanent growth of of pets plus auto scaling up and down instances, and things like that. So uh, that is a big number, though. That's a big number. Can you imagine capacity planning that? You know, like, nope. Something like how do you do that and scale? I, I'm fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Someday when people write books about how they did all this work. And how complicated it was, uh, and then you know you can now attach over 128 EBS volumes on their new M7i instance type, uh, so you can get a lot of volumes now into a box. And so it's been a really great underpinning. And I I sort of feel like EBS was you know right after VPC, EBS is probably the second big innovation that really got cloud to be kind of taken seriously. Um, S3 of course was always kind of the the one that started it all, but uh, really VPC and EBS those two combined are what really I think struck the needle for. Uh, AWS is crazy cloud growth. So you know, thanks to EBS for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so EBS was really one of the key foundational things for really taking advantage of having an elastic workload or, or having a self-healing workload and, and you know, anything attached to a server where, where you could operate it and operate your, your data as its own thing and move it around. Like it's a big, big advancement over what you could do in the data center. Yeah, I feel like they've 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 still miss, missed an opportunity there. You know, getting the data off the the host themselves and off of SSDs or disks on those instances and using instant storage, that was great. Because now if a machine goes down, you don't lose all your stuff. But they still don't support uh, live migration of VMs between hosts. Yeah, and EBS EBS is the key for doing that, but they've they've never enabled that functionality. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not it. Wouldn't be a functionality of EBS necessarily, right? It would be. EBS being the foundation of that. Yeah, I mean, a- external data store is the foundation of that, but they've, they've never gone that far. Like, I kind of wonder why. Pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably hard. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Yeah, my SQL server that's got, you know, 15 terabytes of RAM and, and uh, pegged at 99 CPU won't <laughs> migrate to this other instance. Can you help me? Like, no. Nope. No, nope. we've, we've been there. We've been there with, with VMware for sure. But <laughs> yeah, I uh, I actually had a server, a MySQL database, run out of disk space because it, it filled up one of its um, one of its transaction logs or something like that. And I was like looking at it, and I was like, I'll just do an EBS expansion. Like I can add twenty gigs to it, no big deal. And like fixed my outage, and I went in and I was able to clear out you know all those old logs and and MySQL, and I was good to go. And I reclaimed back down to sixteen gigs of disk space used, but. Uh, yeah, they still can't really shrink as far as I, <laughs> I haven't gone back to look, but I still don't think you can shrink them either. So that's mm-hmm. a, also still kind of a bummer, but that's all right. I'll, uh, I'll live. It's, you know, 100 gigs is a couple pennies in the in this grand scheme of this bill. So, <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice to re- be able to shrink it back down, but I'll take it if that's all. I, I'll take expansion. We're not having it <laughs> for sure. Exactly. Uh, well, they have goodies for you, presents for storage day, of course. Uh, so the first one up is, uh, if you remember us uh, talking about mount point for Amazon S3, which is the uh, admittance by AWS that S3F fuse or S3FS uh, is a thing and that people want it and that it might help in ML workloads. And so that's now generally available. This is a new open source file client that delivers high throughput access, lowering compute costs for data lakes on Amazon S3. Mount point for S3 is a file client that translates local file system API calls to S3 object API calls. Mountpoint source basic file operations can read files up to five terabytes in size. It can listen, read existing files, and create new ones, but it cannot modify existing files or delete directories, and it does not support symbolic linking or file locking or any POSIX uh, extended operation. Uh, Mountpoint will work with all S3 storage classes, including Glacier, which I thought was sort of interesting. And so that is available to you now, generally available if you are a person who wasn't already trying it out in the beta. Accidentally pull down some Glacier data, that's going to be an expensive, like, what's in here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah with great power comes great responsibility ryan <laughs> <laughs> our next gift is uh improvements of the amazon s3 glacier flexible restore time by up to 85 percent using standard retrieval tier and s3 batch operations uh at no additional cost 
Master Data Restore automatically applied to the standard tool tier when using SV Batch Ops. These restores begin to restore objects within minutes, so you can process restored data even faster. Using the S3 batch operations, you can restore archive data at scale by providing the manifest of objects and specifying the retrieval tier, which is, I want to spend all the monies, or I want to spend little monies, <laughs> to retrieve that data off of those uh, S3 uh, objects. So uh, that's uh, actually pretty nice. Uh, this is a bit tricky to do before, and it was very slow. So 85% improvement, uh, they're saying you know, a, a typical job was 30 minutes down to like, a few seconds, uh, which is quite nice where you can actually start using the data. So in a, in a big data machine learning model side, I'm pulling data out of Glacier and I can start using it right away. That's uh, that's valuable combined with your ability to mount it with S3 uh, Fuse. <laughs> no yeah. point for Amazon. <laughs> so you can spend that money even faster. Yeah. Uh, this this just proves that I'm. I think my theory that Glacier is just all their older EBS hardware, and they're just cycling it through. And so now they've moved from SPIDs to SSDs. I'm certain of it. But I also wonder, like, I was thinking about one time, you know, those Amazon warehouses with the robots that you know, move the racks around mm-hmm. to people to pick the parts. Like, what if you had, like, racks full of disks that you just turned off and then you had the robots take them off and stack them as hard as you can? And then when you're like, oh, I need that data that's on that Glacier desk, the robot goes and moves all the things and moves the, dri- moves the mm-hmm. rack hard drives, puts it up to power, connects, then it loads up, does a file scan, integrity check, and then t- starts doing your restore. Yeah, it would explain the time. <laughs> I mean, that's you know anyone who's seen a tape robot in a data center back in the day. Uh, like, yeah, it makes perfect that. sense that that's they're just doing it with this now. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Uh, next gift file release for Amazon F6 for Luster. Which uh, reading this headline, I thought, what Luster doesn't support files? No, no, it does. But this is actually neat. Uh, Amazon F6 for Luster provides fully managed shared storage with scalability and high performance of the open source Luster file system to support your Linux based workloads. At storage, uh, at the storage day, they announced the file release for FSX Luster. This feature helps you manage the data lifecycle by releasing file data that has been synchronized with S3, and file releases free up storage space so that you can continue writing new data to the file system while retaining on-demand access to release files through the FSX Luster lazy loading from S3. Uh, so, if you imagine having uh, a bunch of data that you're dealing with on a disk and you're writing it to the file system. Uh, and you max out your hard drive, <laughs> you can just now off put it to S3 and then clear that out uh, automatically. And then if you need that data back to reload your data set, uh, you can lazy load it back from S3 as necessary in the Luster file system. So uh, that's pretty handy. Uh, especially, again, and that was machine learning AI workloads. I can see how this is really valuable. I just think about several times, you know, several workloads I had where we, you know, we had a growing file system and it was a pain to figure out how to, how to, orchestrate getting that b- backed up to S3 to a cheaper storage option. So this is really nice to have for a lot of workloads. You know, every logging tool I've had, like it would be super nice to have this, right? Or, you know, you're storing your, your raw data and backing it up. Like this is fantastic. Yeah, it's like the ultimate ops solution to a problem that should have been fixed by engineering, but mm-hmm. never was. It's like, you're going to keep writing stuff to this disk, but this going to run out. What can we do about it? Okay, let's build this thing that copies them off silently and, and still, lets mm-hmm. you, still lets you get them. I kind of feel like it might be going a little bit after the, the NetApp on tap market a little bit with the what's effectively just tiered storage, invisible tiered mm-hmm. storage now. It's very similar to what, what on tap provides, uh, tiering from e- EBS down to S3, and that does that fairly transparently as well, except that does support... Um, File modifications still, so you know you can you well, can still yeah, pull in and blocks I, and write blocks. Does the NetApp provide the actual file system? Because FSX will actually, like it's you know it's it's not it's not just block storage that's managing under the covers with that. Like, and I don't know if NetApp is doing the full attachment. Do so they have FSX for NetApp as well? I mean, like <laughs> they do. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. true. Uh, well, I I do know a way to fix that that. You know, developers didn't think about um, deleting data off the disk that they're just <laughs> writing to all the time. If you take a Jenkins server and you write a job, <laughs> you can have the Jenkins server just clear the file directory out on the server. You can do that. I'm just I'm just putting it out there. Too soon. Sorry. Sorry. Not Sorry. not okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving on. Moving okay. on. Right now. Is 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 the door, Ryan? Po- point to where he yeah. point to where he hurt you. <laughs> it was here. It was here. Uh, well, and, and clearly a feature that was not named by Andy Jesse, AWS Backup Logically Air-Gapped Vault is now available to you in preview. The Logically Air-Gapped Vault is a new type of AWS Backup Vault that allows secure sharing of backups across accounts and organizations, supporting direct restore to help reduce recovery times from a data loss event. 
AWS Backup is a fully managed service that centralized and automates data protection across all your AWS services and hybrid workloads. And, um, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before we recorded, Jonathan and I. Uh, it's a terrible name, but like, man, this removes a ton of toil for people who have that pattern where you want to have a separate organization or a separate AWS account mm -hmm. where you back up all of this data to a, a account uh, on a nightly basis or some interval and then you want to restore it. It's actually a real big pain in the butt to get the data back over to the other account where you actually need the data back. So the fact that they've eliminated all this toil uh, is really nice. Uh, they could have given it a better name, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't hate the functionality. <laughs> yeah. Say, On the other hand, you know exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do know exactly what it is. It's very similar to Google naming. I know exactly what this is. Uh, other than you're talking about Composer and and those other weird products yeah. that Google has. Yeah, this is this is huge in the days of you know ransomware and and um, that type of attack vector. And this is just a huge task by many ops teams trying to protect their data and their company's, you know, risk profile. And it's really nice if there's a, an easy button for that. That's fantastic. I'm a little annoyed though that this took so long because like ransomware is not new. Like, I mean, we've been talking about ransomware risks in Amazon for three or four years now, maybe even longer, maybe like six. Um, and I, I do remember there was a magic quadrant that came out recently where they were the magic quadrant actually dinged them for not having a solid answer for ransomware. And now all of a sudden they have this. And I'm like, mm -hmm. why did it take Gartner to tell you that? We've we've all been telling you all over the market, you know, in cloud practitioners that this is something we need to meet compliance requirements. And then why did it take Gartner to get there? So that, that part annoys me just a little bit. I mean, Amazon's still the only one with a real comprehensive solution that's, you know, outside of your your Oregon sort of existing sort of access model. Um, I don't know of any any others that's true google doesn't really like to give you more than one org <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah that's uh and every you know like it's it you can do stuff you know like you can protect your workloads and you can gate access to it but it's still very difficult to sort of really decouple it especially at the organization level which it looks like this is sort of we'll have to look at what it is you know how it's implemented but that's pretty cool so those are your big presents. Uh, they they gave you some sock presents as well, though. Uh, but I think Jonathan needed something about vaults. You want to talk about? Uh, like, what do you, so I mean, if you if you encrypt your data in the vault, where do you store the keys securely so that the keys can't be compromised or attacked or corrupted? Because I think that becomes the next problem down down the line. So great, we've got the backups and they're encrypted because that's best practice. But and now we've got these keys that we need to also keep someplace safe. And uh, I think att attacks on encryption keys is, is probably going to be the next biggest um, sort of destructive power against enterprise. Because if you've got, you've got all encrypted backups and you lose the keys, you've got no encrypted backups. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's a huge risk and key management's hard. So a lot of places don't do it well, right? It's, it's either you use a nuclear blanket option where you encrypt everything with one key and just manage that one close to your chest and you'll probably keep it, probably be fine. Where you have like a million keys and that's even worse. Management yeah. of it's sort of everywhere and hard to rotate, you know, keys. And how do you do you re-encrypt the data when you need to revoke a key? What do you you know, like it's how do you rotate and all these things? Like it's it's a difficult problem to solve at scale. Yeah. All right. Well, your sock presence, uh, they gave you ML research and big data analytics now on EFS, because uh, everyone loves that. Uh, they give you multi-AZ file systems on FSX for OpenZFS, for those of you who think oh, OpenZFS is the future. Uh, there's higher throughput capacity levels for FSX for Windows file server, so all the SQL admins out there can rejoice. And then uh, you can copy data to and from other clouds with AWS DataSync, uh, now generally available. So, uh, yeah, overall, nice storage day. I'm, I was happy with what we got. If I was an MLA, I'd be happier, but I don't. But I still appreciate what they did. And, what, and there are benefits outside of AI ML. If you look through and, and ignore all the FUD about MLAI, <laughs> there are some use cases that this can help you out for other things too. Yeah, there's a, I mean, if I was a CFO, I'd be nervous. Uh, there's a lot of these because the, you know, the, the huge unmentioned cost of all these things is always data transfer in and out. And a lot of these abilities are all moving data around, right? Um, and so the easier you make that, the, the easier it is to get some unexpected bills. And, you know, when I think about multi-AZ file systems, that's the first thing I think of. I was like, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> you know, like, that's, 
Yeah. Use wisely. Yeah, especially with CFS. If you're doing a scrub on the data, I bet that causes some traffic and some mm-hmm. costs. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, good point. Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiatives stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution. Foghorn Consulting. Foghorn Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Foghorn certified AWS, GCP, and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud-native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPod sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul, and they bring their own juice. Well, uh, I don't know about you guys, but the first time I set up an NLB, I was perplexed, even confused, at the fact that I could not apply a security group to my network load balancer which was how you enable it for all load balancers. Uh, and that's because network load balancers aren't actually a thing. They're just some network magic that Amazon does. And so they would just told you that, well, the security group of whatever you're attaching the NLB to uh, takes precedent, and that's what will secure your NLB, which doesn't feel really great uh, in many network architectures. So AWS has finally listened to all of us who were like, huh? And actually released for us security groups support for network load balancers. Uh, and so now you can filter all of your traffic just like any other load balancer, and you can allow that NLB into your server and servers through access controls, etc., all the ways that you expected always to be able to do. And now you no longer have to explain to your security person why this isn't just you know bizarre. <laughs> so I appreciate getting a kind of standard, and uh, I appreciate having the proper pattern for my load balancer access. Yeah, I mean the poor networking team that had to like expand the public subnets in like a rush. Right, because yeah, <laughs> the first thing you do is deploy your server into a private subnet and realize you can't actually get to, can't actually have the security group be the the source IP, and it, it just turned into chaos real fast. <laughs> trying to, yeah, but it took them a long time to fix this. I mean, it was a mm-hmm. it was a complaint like right away. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember Twitter being a flame about this. Like, why don't we have security groups for NLBs? And and you know, now NLBs have been around now for what four years, and they just now got us this. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I imagine it's hard. I imagine so. <laughs> I, I think it's some fundamental design choice they made. It's, yep. it's like, well, why would you need security groups on this when mm-hmm. you've got security groups on the targets? You, you can't have a target that doesn't have a security. You know, I, I can imagine yeah. how the conversation went. <laughs> yeah. Clearly this product manager was the guy who created VPC Classic and was like, you don't need a VPC. You just, you know, <laughs> you just put security groups in everything. Everything will be fine. Mm-hmm. No, no, it doesn't work so well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it definitely felt like this was a one-way door that they they walked through and then realized no one wanted them to walk through that one-way door. <laughs> so it took them a while to get back out. But, I mean, it's, it's important to point out this this is not additional security. This is all in people's nope. heads. Yeah, that is true, too. This is all in your head. Yep, this is just management and just, night. yeah. It, and it's funny because that was, when this came out, that was, I was really conflicted about it because, like, I, I didn't like it, but it is also sort of like the solution was just make me feel better. <laughs> It didn't feel, which isn't good either, right? Like it's, yeah, I mean, the model is that you you put the network controls on the network interface of the resource that, that you're accessing. That's the model for all all the things in AWS. Everything, every everything that is attached to the network has a security group. That's where the that's where the control is applied. So it it shouldn't need mm-hmm. to be applied at the NLB level. One of those weird things I always find though in writing CloudFormation Terraform code for these things is. Uh, the fact that when you specify a security group, you also have to specify it's VPC, but the security group is created inside the VPC, <laughs> um, which makes me think like maybe they had an idea that security groups would branch across VPCs at some point in the future. So never did that either. That's a weird API choice that I never really understood. I'm just kind of thinking of that. What if it's a discovery thing though? Because I mean, if if you were to somehow encode the VPC inside the security group, then you might be able to discover things about people's. VPCs or clouds. You're probably 100 percent correct. It has something to do with AWS's ability to do VPCs and how that software works. I'm sure, <laughs> which is also another white paper I'd love to learn a lot more about. <laughs> like, how do you do networking at this scale? Yeah, hopefully it's common enough to where I even grasp the ideas because it's it's it is 
frighteningly a larger scale. And I just don't know how they manage it. Yeah. Well, if you were excited about those M7i instances we talked about a few weeks here on the show, but you were like, man, I really wish I had an AMD version of that. Uh, <laughs> Amazon has that for you today with the new M7a instances powered by the fifth generation AMD Epic Genoa processors with maximum frequency of 3.7 gigahertz, which offer up to 50% higher performance compared to the M6a instances. Uh, the MCA instances also support the AVX-512 instruction set, the Vector Neural Network instruction set, the Brain Floating Point, and they also support DDR5 memory, which enables high-speed access to data in memory and delivers 2.25 times more memory bandwidth. Uh, you can get this as small as an M7A, which is a one vCPU and 4 gigs of memory, or as large as a bare metal or uh, instance of M7A.48x large, which is 192 vCPUs and 768 gigabytes of memory. Do they they require like a, just a direct integration with your bank with those larger instance sizes? <laughs> I mean, I didn't look at the pricing because I, yeah. I got tired of trying to figure out pricing for new instance types because it's all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And EC2 instances has sort of like had a terrible, terrible existence on its new acquisition company, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, me too. I, I didn't really look at it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably like four or five grand a month or you know, somewhere in that range, maybe three grand typically for these boxes. But if you if you need to compute for your MLAI workload, it's it's all uh, important. And it is it is super important because I mean I think everyone everyone maybe everyone a lot of people agree that AMD kind of missed the boat on AI at least with their GPUs. I mean Nvidia Nvidia are way ahead of the game with with CUDA and um, uh, AMD are just like left in the dust uh, in that regard. But uh, Bfloat sixteen was 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 one of Google's. Um, uh, creations and is is like used by TensorFlow. It's like the native data storage uh, object for TensorFlow, and so actually having that built into the hardware uh, to, will will inc- massively increase the performance of AI workloads on AMD CPUs. So uh, I just went and uh, looked up the price of the MCA seven A because you made me feel guilty that I didn't look it up. <laughs> on demand, on demand <laughs> price in uh, US East is a uh, eight thousand one hundred twenty three dollars and sixty seven cents per month. And the spot price, I was not far off, was $4,570.75. Nice. So if you get it on a three-year reserved uh, RI, or why they have RI in this versus savings plan, it's a thirty-six eighty-four ninety. So I feel pretty darn good about my guess. Because everyone knows this price. I was wrong on that. But everything else, I was, I was not that far off. Yeah. So you're welcome. <laughs> All right, moving on to GCP. Uh, and we had a couple of interesting articles. Uh, first one, I'm sorry, is subscription required if you check it out. But uh, the information has a whole article about how Google is planning to beat OpenAI. They're going to win. I'm convinced. Just like they're going to be number two in cloud. Don't see it yet. <laughs> uh, so in a prior episode, we talked about Google merging their two large artificial intelligence teams. Uh, it had distinct cultures and code to catch up and surpass OpenAI and its rivals. This effort is accumulating into a release of a large machine learning models this fall, and the model zone is Gemini are expected to give Google the ability to, to build products its competitors can't, according to a person involved with Gemini's development. OpenAI can understand and produce conver- conversational text, but Gemini will go beyond that and combining the text capabilities of LLMs like GPT-4 with the ability to create AI images based on text description, similar to AI image generators like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. Uh, it may also be able to analyze charts or create graphics with text descriptions and controlling software using text or voice commands. Google is planning to have Gemini power its Bard chatbot, Google Docs and Slides, and Google will charge app developers to access Gemini through its Google Cloud product. Uh, there's a quote here from James Cham, an AI startup investor at Bloomberg Beta. The big question is what I think everyone has asked for the last nine months is, when will someone even look like they can catch up to open AI? This is going to be the first indication that someone can compete in a legitimate way with GPT-4. And then the article went on to be the big differentiator advantage for this is that Google's using its biggest advantage, which is YouTube. And a large corpus of YouTube video transcripts, but it could also integrate video and audio into the model, giving them multimodal capabilities maybe many researchers believe will be the next frontier in AI. Uh, so interesting to see. Going to be interesting with Google Next coming up very quickly in two weeks. Uh, which, by the way, I should remind you guys that next week's prediction show. <laughs> so get your predictions out there. <laughs> AI, ML, all the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you know, first to press release is not um, always first to market or first to success, for sure. And and so Google announcing that they're working on this amazing thing, that's great. You can talk about it all you like. Pretty sure OpenAI are already working on this. They've already published models for, for, for text and audio and 3D 
uh, 3D objects and uh, they're working on video, all kinds of things. Integrating those into a single model, that would be awesome. That's what Google are kind of um, talking about doing here is, is having kind of like a, a, multi, a multimedia, the multimedia evolution of, of um, large language models or generative AI. I, I don't think they're going to beat OpenAI to it. Um, unless OpenAI end up going out of business because they're, they're sued and lose in the courts. And that's a huge risk right now for them. It's interesting. Yeah. Cause you know, it's, I, I always felt that the, you know, AI was Google's fight to lose, but they, they didn't, they weren't first to market, but in doing so open AI has taken all the risk, right. And trailblazing mm-hmm. all the, the weird legal hurdles and, things like that. So it is kind of an interesting thing. And then Google has this advantage of, of all this data on the back end that I think they've, because they've been working on AI for so long, I'm sure it's been in those service agreements forever. Oh yeah. It'll be, it'll be that, back there for know, 20 like, years ago. We, we yeah, can use your data yeah, yeah. for whatever we like to, to uh-huh. train or improve us to improve our service. Like yep. we, we're using your data to improve our service. It's, it's yeah. such a, such a catch. Very big, uh, very yeah. big answer. So, so it's just going to Google it. The, does stand at a little bit of an advantage, I think, to just come in and swoop in as number two to this space. But I mean, they still have to execute. But. I was thinking, I was listening to a, a NPR news thing earlier today, and they were talking about OpenAI and the the, uh, the lawsuits that are mounting up for copyright infringement. And you know, the claims are always, well, you visited our website and you took our content and used it to, to train your model. And and that's true, and it's, it's it's a bit of a weird area for me because you know if if I can go to NewYorkTimes.com and I can I can read the article myself and I can learn something from it, is that not what you intended from 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 delivering this service in the first place? Uh, but you know, OpenAI their their service is going to be monetizing the model that they built from all that data. Google will be monetizing trolling people's websites for you know. 25 years so, <laughs> so it, it would be a very interesting court case if if new york yeah. times went to went to court and took google there and said hey you, you you're taking our data from our website and using it for these for this purpose and google will say well you want us to <laughs> mm-hmm. you want us to index your site and you know, we're providing a service to you kind, kind of can't have it both ways it is sort of uh, and then there's you know the, there's there's the, is this copyright infringement? And then is there, what are the damages, right? Like how much are they entitled to? And so like, cause it can mean, you know, the world, whether they're, you know, at, do they get a percentage of every penny for open AI that'll bankrupt them? But you know, like it's kind of crazy. Like how do you, how do you demonstrate this has had a material impact on your business? Yeah. Well, if you think about the legal challenges, that's probably the number one reason why Microsoft just hasn't bought them outright. <laughs> By keeping them as an investor outside, they're like, oh, well, that was, you know, we were just an investor. We weren't, you know, yeah. they kind of have some some distance from it if the legal, you know, rulings come out otherwise. But, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the ramifications of a ruling against them about being able to go to a website and being able to, you know, scrape the data off a website and go use it um, is sort of, you know, problematic for companies like Wayback or the Internet Archive and how they mm-hmm. archive websites because, you know, they typically live inside of this, like, well, you're putting it on the public domain. It's like driving down the street. You know, if it's on the side of your building and you wrote it, then it's public domain because it's in a public space. And the Internet has been kind of traditionally been seen as a public space unless you put a paywall up or you put up a login screen where you can't get to that data. Um, and so that that's going to be interesting to see how that, you know, works out in copyright court as well. Because it could have much larger implications. I mean, it, which way would you? Not exactly if you were the judge, but which which way would you want that case to go? If if it did end up in court, would you would you want um, free use of publicly available internet facing resources, or or not, or something in between? I would say, yeah. If it's if it's public out there, then it's at least available for use. Like I, I, I don't really, I, I get why people are sort of upset about it you know when you think about you know github and the code on there for um for their solution which i'm blanking on the name right now but you know i can kind of see you know that's a little different you didn't really intend it for that but it's also sort of when you think about new york times and all these things that are public facing and do have you know a lot of data that's out there like i don't understand why you would have an expectation that that remain private or if someone was able to monetize the information itself yeah, it's 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 all going to come down to 
derivative works and those Sarah Silverman's case against against OpenAI is over derivative works because you can have it recite almost word for word some of her content. I mean, I've watched some of her stuff on YouTube or, or Netflix. I could recite some of her content. Am I infringing mm -hmm. her copyright by having right. paid to watch a show and memorize some of it because, you know, it's amusing or useful or something else? I don't know. It's... I mean, there's a large precedent in the courts, and I, I don't think there's any way where it ends up in a situation where OpenAI has to either, you know, really strictly define their data set and, and limit it down or, or somehow pay restitution or damages to these companies. I don't I don't see any way that it actually shakes down, but I think that it'll be in the minutia of how these things get applied where in the future going forward, it'll where it'll be interesting. Well, another thing is, is you, you know, these companies get advantage from having you know, it's no different than the Google crawler crawling your website for SEO mm -hmm. to get you into the right. Google search index. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so it, it's sort of going to be this interesting, you know, like the way to solve this is use update your robots.txt to not allow these, you know, bots to scan your website, but then you're also not going to be in Google search, which seems like a bigger detriment to your website as well. So, you know, it's going to be interesting. And, you know, there are probably like, it's like, you know, there was something, a report that maybe all the Harry Potter books were fed into it as part of the training model. You know, but did they find that on the internet as a on a web page or a forum somewhere where someone posted a PDF of the book? Okay, like so, there's going to be legitimate things where stuff that shouldn't have got sucked up into the model get sucked into the model via you know other bad models. You just had to figure out a way to poison those type of resources so that it comes out of the model in the future. Well, and that's the trick, right? Who's liable? The 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 person hosting the forum or the person uploading the document straight into the forum like that that's the minutia i think that i'm talking about where it's we'll have to figure out some weird weird areas on on responsibility and well it's like the a, it's going to be like an ai dmca right like you have to mm -hmm. be able to provide a way for people to understand what you use in the model yeah. and then we have it removed from the model when if they don't like it and that's yeah. probably the controls that we're going to have and you know companies like open ai are going to fight that because it diminishes the value of their model so yeah We'll see. It'll be interesting. Yeah. The court cases are the most interesting part of AI right now because, you know, the chat GPT stuff is fun. We use it for the show notes quite often for different things. Um, and it's it's very helpful, but like it's not earth changing in many cases yet. And even we're <laughs> hearing, you know, things like uh, Copilot for coding. Great for engineers who understand what they're doing because, you know, you know, it helps you get rid of toil. But if you're a new engineer coming into the market, you know, you're not learning how to code. You're not learning constructs. You're not learning structures. You're not learning the fundamentals that you need to know to be able to write good code, and it's going to cause other long-term ramifications. So you got to there's a double-edged sword to everything. It, it's a junior engineer, I think. I, I use it like a junior engineer. I I know I know what I want to do. I know I can do it myself, and I know I can explain what I want out of it, and I can write up that story for for ChatGPT or Bard or anything in five minutes and have it do the work that would that would take me. 30 minutes or 60 minutes or, or you know, in, in the space of seconds. But, um, it, the, 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 the fair use and the copyright thing, it's, it's really quite bizarre. I think it, I think it, it may end up shaking up the whole, um, the whole concept of, of copyright and, and fair use in the industry. Like any, any book that you, 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 bu you, you buy or get from the library, like the first cover is like standard, uh, boilerplate text, which has been probably in every book for about the past hundred years, you know, no part of this publication can be reproduced or blah, 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 without permission of the author or the publisher or something else. But yet kids go to school and they have to read books and they have to write essays and they have to quote from the text. Like, is that, is that's reproduction. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, as long as you cite it though, Jonathan, it's okay. You just have to cite it properly. <laughs> So my, uh, yes, that's right, <laughs> and that's a problem for AI for sure. I think I think there's a third choice though. I think openly, I don't have the money to to pay out for these copyright claims. They'll put them out of business. But I think the the other option for prosecuting people or or go or sort of licensing content is is on the is on the users of the content that's been generated so i can go to open ai say i can say fine write me write me something that's a bit like this joke or write me something in the style of this person that shouldn't that shouldn't be open ai's problem they're not infringing any copyright by generating that my use of that could be an infringement of copyright so i think i think the liability may shift to the users of the platform rather than the operators of the platform i mean that's you know, when you think about, you know, who's, who's liable for content on social media, that's the way it's shaken down is that, you know, the metas and, and Twitter's aren't 
aren't liable for that data, or at least they don't have the liability to that. They have, they do have some responsibilities as far as curating content and, and reacting to content, but, but can you actually, you know, sue someone on, on Facebook for, for slander or libel because of what was on there now? you know, like that kind of thing. So it is a kind of this interesting, it'll, it will be very interesting to see how this shakes down. Yeah. All right. And our final story tonight, uh, Google is launching a pricing API to help enterprises optimize their cloud costs. Uh, the API will provide businesses with real-time visibility into their cloud usage and costs and will allow them to set budgets and alerts. The API is also designed to help businesses identify and eliminate waste in their cloud usage. Pricing API is part of Google's cloud billing services, which provides businesses with tools to manage your costs. Uh, again, like I look at this API and uh, like setting budgets doesn't save me money. <laughs> like let's stop t- let's stop saying setting a budget does that. Setting an alert doesn't save me money either because you know if I kick off that job that uh, just used up a ton of resources at eight o'clock at night and I went to bed and then the alert fired and I got an email that I'm going to spend a billion dollars. I'm not going to know that until the morning. I've already spent half a billion dollars. So these things. You know, don't really necessarily help you in all these things. And then there are just recommendations that are kind of dumb in cases like, oh, yeah, we think based on your CPU and memory from outside the box, and not understanding anything about your app, that you can make an adjustment here and save money. Those are always prone to error if you just take them blindly on surface value. So be careful with the pricing API. Um, I do appreciate that there's an API there to get pricing data, which is helpful. Uh, that makes it easier to build your spreadsheets. Uh, and get uh, your models updated in real time as pricing changes. And Google keeps trying to increase prices, so you need to keep on top of that because uh, your spreadsheets change all the time. I mean, this is the response to the age-old problem, right? The CFO wants to save money. Everyone else in the business wants to empower developers to move faster, right? Like, and it's sort of like, how do you reconcile those two worlds? So, I mean, these APIs, yes, setting in budgets and stuff via APIs, but what it really does is empower approval workflows. <laughs> So that communication is happening about money being spent. And that's really the the value in these things. And so, you know, like you set a budget and then you exceed that budget and that triggers a workflow of, of approvals. And then you can automatically update that budget to not block the business. But now you've communicated to the business that, hey, this is getting more expensive. And then you can also build into your deployment tools like, hey, this change is going to cost you $6 million a month. Are you sure? You know, so that's always nice too. If if it's if it's instrumented well enough, where you can put that kind of logic in in place, yeah. maybe able to tie it into like uh, Terraform <laughs> or OpenTF, mm-hmm. uh, and to be mm-hmm. able to dynamically say, you know, how much does it cost with a real time API? I kind of like that. I mean, there are plugins mm-hmm. like that for Terraform today, but they're, you know, I don't know their data source, but it, you know, they start using publicly available data sources directly from the cloud provider. That's that's great. Mm-hmm. So there's. A, Lots of benefits. The the Terraform enterprise version of this, where it told you the cost was it wasn't it didn't work in GCP. It only worked in AWS, and it was because of the, the API lack of API. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the, the the best thing about the best thing about this feature though is that it, it shows you your custom pricing. So you've got custom pricing agreements. You've got enterprise discounts. You've got um, it, you know if you if you're using an instance which is uh, covered by a, a CUD or something else, it provides you the actual cost of that, mm-hmm. that resource based on your agreements with Google. Which and is pretty handy. I that's mean, that's mm-hmm. very nice. AWS has been on their API. So yeah, this is nope. uh, <laughs> this is definitely a benefit. But then you know now you have to auth to this API versus Google, Amazon's. You don't have to auth to it. You just it's a public API. Um, so now if you want your own private pricing, you have to do an auth effort, which isn't a big deal, but. I don't think uh, KubeCost understands that quite yet. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully uh, sometime in the future, uh, that'll get added and supported. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, those, those intermediaries, I wonder how they'll support that because they need to sort of proxy the authentication details through. It'll be maybe through OAuth you can make that happen. Interesting. Yeah. There's always uh, sharp edges in some of these things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, that's another fantastic week here in the cloud, guys. Uh, great chat. Excited to see what uh, Google comes out with a couple weeks from now. So uh, get those predictions ready. AI, Kubernetes. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see what it is next week. Uh, we'll talk to you all next week here in the cloud. See you later. Bye, everybody. And that is the Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag the cloud pod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions.